اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی سیدنا و حبیبنا حبیب اله العالمین محمد و علی آله الطیبین الطاهرین المعصومین المنتجبین in the context of what we were discussing in the past few nights, I would like to bring to your attention verse number 34 of Surah Tawbah. This verse created a real issue in the early history of Islam, both when the Quran was being compiled and in terms of the interpretation. Now, I recite the verse first and just give you a very quick meaning, and then I will discuss what issue did, did it create, and uh, the two viewpoints which existed on this verse, which goes quite in line with what we are talking about, the ta'wil of the Qur'an, and the battle for ta'wil of the Qur'an. Now the verse 24, uh, sorry, 34 of Surah Tawbah is, أَوْضُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu inna kathiran min al-ahbar wa al-ruhban la ya'kuluna amwala al-nas bil-batil wa yasudduna an sabil Allah wa alladhina yaknizuna al-dhahab wa al-fiddat wa la yunfiqunaha fi sabil Allah fabashirhum bi'adhab ali O you who believe Indeed, many of the Ahbar and Ruhban, Ahbar were the scholars of the Jewish faith, and Ruhban were the scholars of the Christian faith, or the monks of the Christian faith. So, talks about Ahlul Kitab, talks about Jews, talks about Christians, or some say that Ahbar and Ruhban are two different groups of the Jewish uh, religious leaders. In kathiran min al Ahbar wa Ruhban, they eat up people's wealth wrongfully. These are, of course, religious leaders. And they bar from the path of Allah. And those who treasure up gold and silver and do not spend it in the way of Allah, inform them of a painful punishment. And then the following verses, يَهُمَ يُحْمَى عَلَيْهَا فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمْ فَتُكْوَى بِهَا جِبَاهُهُمْ وَجُنُوبُهُمْ وَظُهُورُهُمْ On the day when these, that is the silver and gold, shall be heated in hellfire and therewith branded on their foreheads, their sides, and their backs. And they are told, this is what you treasured up for yourself. Very uh, alarming and very wonderful sort of statement by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those especially, especially religious leaders who eat up the wealth of people wrongfully in the name of faith. This is, of course, what the verse is contextually talking about. Uh, but generally, it talks about treasuring money, treasuring gold and silver. That's dirham and dinar. That was the because gold and silver was the uh, the currency uh, on the day in which they used for their transactions. It is reported from the Prophet peace be on him that when this verse was revealed, Prophet was moved very much. And he said, Tabban lil dhahab, Tabban lil fiddah. Curse on gold, curse on silver. Tabban, they mean curse, or they be far away from us, cut off, they be, may, be, may they be cut off from us. And then the Ashab said, oh, All of us are actually ha have ambition for gold and silver. We want to, to have money, wealth. So, what should we? Seek what should be our ambitions in life. And Prophet, peace be on him, said, Lisanan dhakira, 
وقلبا شاكرا وزوجة تعين أحدكم على دينه You ask not for gold and silver ask for a tongue which is all the time in remembrance of Allah mentions the name of Allah and a heart which is grateful and a spouse which helps you with your faith is supportive of your faith this is what is of course much much better than gold and silver anyhow that's uh, just uh, an admonition from the prophet peace be on him and uh, there's another interesting hadith if i can find it here from the prophet peace be on him that he said to one of his companions to bilal actually that Ya Bilal, if you can die, if you can meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, poor, do that. Let me find the hadith. Uh, yeah, it says to Bilal, if you can f meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, poor, qala Rasulullah, Ya Bilal, القلها فقيرا ولا تلقه ولا تلقه غنية meet Allah poor not rich well this goes against all our mentality isn't it that we are after riches we are after wealth so what does prophet mean by that and if we do not actually seek wealth we cannot spend it in way of faith isn't it نعم الأون على التقوى Dunya, dunya, wealth is very good support for taqwa. So what does it mean that you try to meet Allah poor? He says, If you are given plenty of wealth, do not hide it. If you are asked for something, do not prevent it. Give it. Do not stop giving. And if you do this, you actually do not leave anything behind you. What the hadith is saying is that do not leave your money for after your death to be distributed without your control. You do it yourself. Not that you do not seek wealth. You seek wealth, but if you have actually given, when need comes, then you will meet Allah poor, although you have been very rich in this world. Although you have been very rich, you will meet Allah poor. Al-Ghillaha faqeeran wa la ghaniya, not ghani. Okay, let's come back to the controversy of the, on the verse. The controversy was with regards to two issues. One is a hadith reported by many, many scholars. Ibn Abi Shayba, Bukhari, Ibn Sa'd. Abu Hatam, and many others. They have reported this hadith, so this is somehow quite uh, agreed upon hadith. Zayd ibn Wahab says that I was traveling, passing by Rabada. Rabada was the birthplace of Abu Zar. We discussed about Abu Zar last night and that he was deported by Uthman to Rabada. He said, I was passing by Rabada and I met Abu Zar. فقلت ما أنزلك بهذه الأرض Why have you ended up in this land? It was actually an uncultivated, uncivilized, uninhabited land. So why have you come here? And actually Abu Zar and his wife were living there completely alone. No one else was there. They were actually banished to such a place. And you, you have heard when Abu Zar was dying, his wife was crying that, well, how can I bury you? I don't know how to do the burial and ghost and kafan. I don't know. How should I somehow uh, complete the ceremonies for you? And Abu Zah said, don't worry. The prophet has told me that I will die alone, but a group of mu'minun will pass by and will bury me. So very quite alone in that place. And this happened, of course. Zayd ibn Wahab said that I asked Abu Zar, what? has brought you to this land. 
He summarized, Abu Zar summarized, of course, there was long story, just made the long story short. He said, Kunna Sham, we were in Syria with Muawiyah. فَقَرَأْتُ وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِرَّةِ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرْهُمْ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Those who hoard and treasure gold and silver do not do infaq fi sabil Allah. Of course, he will later explain, or I will explain from his tongue what he means by that. Not any type of wealth, not any person becoming wealthy. Specific type of wealth he is, uh, he is targeting. Those who do not spend it in the way of Allah, so uh, give them the news of adabun alim, a painful punishment. Faqala Muawiyah. This is actually a verse he was continuously going to the gate of the palace of Muawiyah and was reciting this verse. And of course, explaining it. Faqala Muawiyah ma hadhi fina. Hadhi fi ahl al kitab. Muawiyah said, This verse is not about us, it's about ahl al kitab. He says, Inna kathira min al ahbar wa ruhman. Jews and Christian monks and scholars. What, is it, what has it got to do with us? We are Muslims. Why should we be worried about this? فَقَالَ مُعَاوِيَ مَا هَذِهِ فِينَا هَذِهِ فِي أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ قُلْتُ أَنَا إِنَّهَا لَفِينَا وَفِيهِمْ I said, no, it is about us and them. And that is why I'm here now. You see, the, the difference of opinion approach. The way Amirul Mu'min was looking at the Quran, actually taking lessons from everything, generalizing all the lessons, admonishments, rather than fixing it to a specific group of people. This is what Abu Zar was doing, and this is why he was banished here. This was about the explanation, uh, and I will, of course, uh, explain, uh, bring more hadith on this, uh, which explains why they were so much upset by Abu Zar because of this. And actually, most of the exegetes, uh, if we go to the uh, books of exegesis, from the old days till now, they say that Muawiyah was right and Abu Zar was wrong, unfortunately. Because Abu Zar didn't know how the wealth should be spent, how the wealth is acquired. Now, regarding the, the compilation, the writing of the verse. You know that the Quran, just a brief, very, very shortly I explain, the Quran was compiled by the companions of the prophets during his lifetime. And companions had their own copies of the Quran. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud had his own copy, Abu Musa had his own copy, Ubay ibn Ka'ab had his own copy, and they were reading from it. However, after the demise of the Prophet, Abu Bakr and Umar ibn al-Khattab, they also wanted to have a copy. And they asked Zayd ibn Sabit to write a copy of the Quran for them. And this is the hadith which comes in Bukhari that Zayd ibn Sabit says that I went and searched on parchments, stones, bones, and these things. I brought ayat together and I compiled it. Uh, Many Sunni scholars think that this was the only Quran compiled after the Prophet, peace be on him. However, this is not a correct view for overwhelming evidence that Mus the Muslims did not refer to this Quran at all. This Quran was placed in Hafsa's house. It was archived, so to speak. Why? The reason is Zayd ibn Sabit was a young man. He uh, was about 23, 24 years old. Although he was one of the scribes of the Prophet, peace be on him, but he didn't have that knowledge of the Quran like Ubay ibn Ka'ab, like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, like Ali ibn Abi Talib. So people did not very much take heed of that compilation. And the compilation was left in Hafsa's house. This is what the history says. And the Muslims had other copies for themselves. They were reading. Now, these readings became quite uh, different from each other. Even with the copies, when they were copying, they actually made mistakes in copying. They were hearing something and writing 
it the way they heard it while it was a mistake. So at the time of the Uthman, at the time of Uthman ibn Affan, the companions collectively decided to unify or to create a unified copy of the Quran, an authentic copy of the Quran, and of course burning all other copies. And this actually, of course, needed the authority of the caliph. And that's why Uthman uh, authorized it, and they ordered, he ordered that this should be done, and all companions came together, and they compiled a Quran which was agreed by everyone, every Sahabi, including Ali ibn Abi Talib, including Abdul uh, Ubay ibn Kaab and others, they all agreed upon this unified copy. All other copies were burnt. This copy is what we are reading now. This copy which was compiled at the time of Uthman is what we are reading now, not a cop any copy of other companions who compiled the, uh, their own personal copies. And this copy is widely reported to us. It is mutawatir. So epistemologically, it gives us a certain knowledge that this is what was compiled during the time of companions of the Prophet, the, of the Quran, which they had heard from the Prophet. They had written down. All copies came together. And for this copy, of course, they did not trust Zayd ibn Sabit. Because they didn't, not they didn't trust in his integrity, they didn't trust in his knowledge. So they removed him as he was appointed by Uthman for the head of the committee. They removed him and they placed Obay ibn Kaab, who was trusted by everyone and was the most knowledgeable, of course, after Ali ibn Abi Talib, in terms of Quran recitation. And this copy was compiled. And I think this was something which was a turning point in Muslim history. Had the companions not done this, we wouldn't have had the Quran now. Now, you don't object that, well, Allah says, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidun. Well, this is the way he protected the Quran. He always do things through its means. Not that he does it by miracle or something. This is the way Allah protected the Quran. Now, when this Quran was compiled, some of the companions had their own views about the way they had heard the verses from the Prophet, peace be on him. Of course, under, unless there was overwhelming, overwhelming evidence that this was recited in this way, uh, the companions wouldn't have agreed to put it in the Quran, including, as I said, there was a committee, and of course supervised by the most knowledgeable, and we believe that it was supervised by Ali ibn Abi Talib as well. Not that he directly was involved, but he was, of course, supervising, looking what they were doing. He did not object to anything they compiled. And therefore, that means that he was quite happy of that compilation. Now, when this Quran was being compiled, some companions came and said, OK, we have heard from the Prophet that he recited this verse. And then the knowledgeable companions, they said, no, this was not a verse of the Quran. This was a hadith you heard, and you thought that this is the verse of the Quran. So they were rejecting different people coming and saying that this is part of the Quran we heard from the Prophet such and such. Now, this is where, of course, this agreement comes about reciting this verse. Some people were very adamant, including the hadith. This is from Durr al-Manthur of As-Suyuti. Uh, he says that uh, some companions wanted to drop vav from this verse because that changes the meaning completely. Now look how clever this, this is. Inna Uthman ibn Affan lamma arada an yaktub al masahif. When Uthman decided to write the masahif, the copies of the Quran, as I said, this was under his authority, not that he did it. Inna Uthman ibn Affan, lamma arada an yaktub al masahif, aradu an yulqu al waw alati fi bara'a. They wanted to drop the waw which is in bara'a. Which waw? Look, listen to the verse now. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. 
إن كثيرا من الأحبار والرهبان ليأكلون أموال الناس بالباطل. A great number of أحبار and رهبان they eat up the property of wealth of the people wrongfully. Now, والذين يكنزون الذهب والفضة or الذين يكنزون الذهب والفضة. This waf here, this waf here is very important, and this is what actually. Uh, Abu Dhar was arguing with others as well. Why it's important? Because if it's without wav, if it's without wav, alladina yaknazun al zahaba wal fiza would be the attribute of al ahbar wal ruhban. So it doesn't concern us. It's related to al ahbar and ruhban of Yahud. Ya ayuha alladina aman winna kathira min al ahbar wal ruhban la yaakuluna amwal al nasib al batil. Who are these al ahbar wal ruhban? Alladina yaknazun al zahaba wal fiza, those who treasure gold and silver. But if we say, walladina yaknazun al zahaba wal fiza, this is not an attribute of ahbar and ruhban anymore. This is very general. It's very general. Anyone treasuring gold and silver and not spending it in the way of God is included. Now, Asuyuti mentions that when Uthman was compiling the Mus'haf, they wanted to drop Wav from وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنُزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفَذَةَ قَالَ أَبِيزَرْ As I said, all the companions were all ears and eyes watching what was being compiled. Although the committee was composed of only 12 people, but all the companions were watchful. What was happening? What was being compiled? Qala Abu Zar, Qala Abu Zar, la tulhqanha aw la adhanna sayfi ala atiqi. You put this wall here, or I take my sword and fight you. And of course, he had many supporters among other companions, including Ali ibn Abi Talib, certainly. Supporters that this wall should be here. Now, this wall. It's a very simple wav, but you see, sometimes things become very, very significant in history. Because this wav actually defined the approach to Islam's attitude towards wealth. This wav was actually defining here. So Abu Zar said, you put this wav here, or I take my sword and fight you. فَالْحَقُوهَا because everyone knew that this wav, that they had heard it from the Prophet, that this wav was there, and they put it there. So, what was it which was annoying Abu Zar? Was it the wealth of people? No. Of course, there were many wealthy people. At the time of the Prophet, after the Prophet, in the time of the two caliphs, who, of course, Abu Zar accepted their sort of style with regards to Bayt al-Mal. He didn't object. He was objecting the style of Uthman ibn Affan to Bayt al-Mal. And he was reciting this in Medina every day. He was coming and reciting this verse in Medina until Uthman deported him to Syria. And he was reciting it there as well. Now, a couple of... Uh, Traditions explaining what was the position. Uh, Abdul Razak, in his Musannaf, says that, uh, and this is reported in Tafsir al Qummi as well, so it's both from Shia and Sunni sources. This is the, the wording is from Tafsir al Qummi. Kana Abu Dhar al Ghafari yahdu kull yawm wa huwa fi sham. Every day he was coming. Fayunadi bi a'la sawtihi. When he was in Sham, he was shouting at the top of his voice. Bashir ahla al kunuz bi kayyan fil jabah wa kayyan fil junub wa kayyan fil zuhur. Good news for those who treasure money with heating of those money, putting their in, on their foreheads, sides, and backs, the, the, the verse actually. And this was somehow a, 
a response to Muawiyah, who said that this wealth that we collect is our wealth. This doesn't belong to Muslims. He said, Malullah lana wal ardu arduna. And this is what, of course, he said, the territory belongs to us. And this was the attitude of some of the companions, which thought that the fay, the Baytul Mal of Muslimun, was under the control of the caliph. He can do whatever he wants. And this was very different from the style of Omar and Abu Bakr. They didn't go this far, of course. They didn't go this way. They were saying that this belongs to Muslimun. We are just trustees. We distribute it. However, from the time of Uthman, the attitude changed. The ta'wil of everything changed. The approach to everything changed. And they said that, no, this belongs to us. We can put it wherever we think is correct and is right. And here, Sa'ad ibn Suhan and Ahnaf ibn Qais actually objected to Muawi. What is this sort of a statement that you are making? Everyone knows that this belongs to, uh, to Muslimun. Ibn Athir in Al Kamil Fat Tarikh. As I said, these are history, this, are, this is not aqidah, this is history. He says that Muawiyah thought that Abu Zar is coming to his palace and actually reciting this verse repeatedly because. He doesn't have anything himself because he's poor and they are rich. And so he envies them. He's jealous. So he sent one night, he sent 1,000 dinar for him. 1,000 dinar was a lot, a lot. With 50 dinars, with 50 dinars, you could buy a very big house. So you can imagine what is 1,000 dinar. It's in Nahjul Balagha that when Shurei al Qazi had bought a big house with 80 dinars, and that's much later, at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Amir al Mu'minin rebuked him that this is not something that someone like you uh, would be suitable to someone like you. So sent him 1,000 dinar. Now, where did he bring this 1,000 dinar? It was from Beit Mal, isn't it? But he thought that, well, I can spend it the way I wish. So, Abu Zar accepted all the 1,000 dinars. And Muawiyah became very happy. That, okay, now I have the weak point. And the same night, he went and distributed the whole 1,000 among the poor in the city, in Sham. Now, tomorrow, Muawiyah, because he, he wanted actually to use this as a ploy, he sent his servant to, Muawi, to Abu Zar and s uh, said to him, go to Abu Zar and say that I'm very sorry, I made a mistake, this money was meant for someone else. And I by mistake brought it for, to you. So if I do not take it back from you, uh, then Muawiyah will punish me severely. Can you please give me back the money? Now Abu Zar said, no problem. I give you back the whole money, but give me three days because I have to go and collect this from all those people among whom I've distributed it. And Muawiyah thought, well, this is shameful. I mean, Abu's are going and telling people, look, this money was given me, to me by mistake. I have to give it back. So he said, leave him. And then he wrote to Uthman that if you want Syria, remove Abu Zar from here. And of course, why he couldn't do anything with Abu Zar? Because he was the companion of the Prophet. And he told Abu Zar once that if I was allowed to do whatever I wanted with the companion of the Prophet, because Uthman has ordered me, you do not touch companions of the Prophet, I would have, done, I, I would have known what to do with you. So he sent him back. Now one question. Wasn't Hussein a companion of the Prophet? Let alone being the grandson of the Prophet. He was a companion of the Prophet or not? He was. So you see at the time of Muawiyah in Sham, in Syria, he has the orders, do not touch any companion of the Prophet. Because this is going to create great disorder among Muslims, that we are killing companions of the Prophet. 
Now look what, how the Muslim community has degenerated. That they kill Hussein alayhi salam, and no one says anything. Because now they feel that they are absolutely established and firm. Uh, what was this wealth which Abu Zar was very angry about? He was angry because what belonged to the poor, and people were really poor, were really poor. When Ali came to power, you see how he lived. Just as he explains in Nahjul Balagh, I take two loaves of bread a day and nothing else. And when he was asked about it, he said, because I want to live like the poor people in my sovereignty, under my sovereignty. So people were really poor. They couldn't afford even their, their bread. And look how some people had become rich. And this was not what they had gained by their own business or by their own efforts. When the, all the booties of Egypt came to Uthman, and you cannot imagine, I mean, you cannot count how much it was, how many thousands, hundreds, thousands of dinar it was. He gave all that to Marwan ibn al-Hakam. All that to Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Marwan was his cousin. Hakam ibn Abil al-As was his uncle. Affan was the son of Abil al-As, and Hakam was son of Abil al-As. And this is what outraged Abu Zar. Once, in a meeting with Abu Zar, with Uthman, he said, I heard from the Prophet, when the descendants of Abu al-As come to power and their number is 30, then corruption will come. And Uthman asked the people who were around him, who were companions of the Prophet as well, have you heard this from the Prophet? They said, no. So he said, you are lying, that, therefore. You are lying because no one has heard this from the Prophet. He said, are you really thinking that I am attributing a lie to the Prophet? He said, okay, I will ask Ali. He summoned Ali, peace be on him. Ali came and he said that Abu Zar is saying, this hadith is reported, this hadith from the Prophet. Have you heard this? He said, no, I haven't. He said, so Abu Zar is a liar. He said, no, Abu Zar is not a liar. I believe in him. And I believe that Prophet has said it. I haven't heard it. But I believe that Prophet have said it, has said it. Why? Because I heard from the Prophet that no earth has ever seen and no sky has ever shadowed on a person more honest and more frank than Abu Zar. And then he said, have you not heard this from the Prophet? They said, yes, we have heard this from the Prophet. So, so Abu Zar is correct. Abu Zar is right. So he gave the whole Ghanima of Egypt to Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Was he allowed to do it? This is what outraged Abu Zar. Was this not to be distributed among Muslims? This was different approach. He gave 300,000 dirham to Harith ibn al-Hakam, another uh, brother of Marwan ibn al-Hakam. He gave 300,000 to Abdullah ibn Usaid. And Mas'udi mentions that some of companions and people who were actually close to Osman, when they passed away, they had such a wealth that even we cannot imagine in, in our imagination. So what had happened? What had happened? Why that sort of austere an ascetic life at the time of the Prophet, al-Muhajirun al-Ansar, living in that austere way, having that sacrificial attitude towards faith, now have come to this issue. Of course, then uh, when Ali comes to power, they expect the same thing from him. They expect the same thing. And because Ali said, by God, I will return everything. I will take away everything given to you which did, you did not deserve as your share from Baytul Mal. Even, even if you have given it as a mahar to women, I will take it back from you. Of course, he makes everyone enemy with him. This was a different ta'wil, this was a different attitude than what the 
some of the companions had. Now look, Mas'udi in Muruj al-Zahab, he mentions when Zubayr passed away, he had 50,000 dinar cash. 50,000 dinar cash. Just remember I mentioned you could buy a big house with 50 dinar. 50,000 dinar cash. 1,000 horses, 1,000 slaves, and many, many houses and farms and lands and houses in Kufa, in Alexandria, in Basra, and his city in Basra was so splendid, sorry, his house in Basra was so splendid, so glorious, that in the year 332, when Mas'udi is writing this, he says this house is famous still in Basra, 332. Talhat ibn Ubaidullah, now these two, broke their pledge with Ali. Because, I don't want to say because or why, certainly Ali didn't have the same attitudes. Ali actually made it clear for everyone by not using, by not giving a little bit more wheat to Aqil when he, his children, his daughters were hungry, he actually made it clear for everyone that do not expect that when Beitul Mal comes, when booties come, I'm going to give 100,000, 200,000, 50,000 dinar or dirham to any one of you. Certainly, I'm not going to do this. So when Talha passed away, his wealth was estimated to be 100,000 dinar. And he had 1,000 dinar income, 1,000 dirham income daily in Iraq. And 10,000 dinar in Syria. Zayd ibn Sabit was very close to Osman, of course, and the, the compiler of the first Quran for, for Abu Bakr and Omar. When he passed away, his silver and gold were being broken by hammer. So much just gold amassed in one place, and silver amassed in one place, not even using it for business, just amassing it in one place. Now, this is what Abu, Abu Zar was saying, And Muawiyah used to say that this is about Jews. He said, no, this is about them and us. This is the difference in understanding, difference in approach. Okay, that's enough. Because we get, because we get angry when we discuss these issues, of course. Uh, let me talk a little bit about Abbas now. A completely change of climate. And uh, now from wealth and money and gold and silver, we come to loyalty and sacrifice and faith and glory. Of course, not vain glory. Glory which really uh, Abbas is deserved of. Abbas was born on 26th of Hijrah. So that is in the, of course, rulership of Uthman, he was born. So when his father passed away, Amirul Mu'minin, he had about 14 years old. He, he was about 14 years old. And therefore in Karbala, he should have been 34 years because Karbala happened 20 years after the demise, the martyrdom of Amirul Mu'minin His mother, Fatima, uh, of the tribe Banu Kalab, which later on, because he gave, she gave birth to four sons for Amir al he was called Umm al mother of the sons. And the sons were Abbas, Abdullah, Ja'far, and Uthman, all of whom were killed in Karbala. And you certainly have heard that when he was mourning uh, his sons in Medina, he, in, in Baqi, he made the 
so form of four graves, and he used to go there every day and mourning for his sons, saying that Ya man ra al Abbas karra ala jamahir al Naqad wa warahu min abna Haydar kull leis in the labad. Has anyone seen Abbas when he was going to, to the battle and sons of Ali, like lions, were going after him? And many other poems that she used to recite there. Uh, there's a story that uh, Amir al Mu'minin knew somehow with that knowledge of the Imam that Abbas is going to make such a sacrifice and lose his hands. And therefore he used to kiss his hands, Abbas's hands, very frequently. And of course, the report is not authenticated. However, it's not as strange because sometimes things are inspired, people are inspired, people of that caliber are inspired by certain knowledge, which of course we are unaware of. Remember in Surah Qasas, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمْ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضَئِي We inspired to Umm Musa. Milk your son, فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمْ When you are afraid, when you fear for, for him, then throw him in the river. إِنَّا رَادُّهُ إِلَيْكِ وَجَاعِلُهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ We are going to return him to you and we are going to make him one of the messengers. So this news that Musa was going to become a messenger, she knew it right from the beginning. Even before committing him to the, to, to Nile, to the Nile, she knew that he was going to be a messenger. So it's not very strange if we think that this was something, this was a knowledge known by Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam. Uh, uh, a group of historians report from Amir al Mu'minin that he said, Inna waladi al Abbas zuk al il mazaka. My son Abbas has been fed knowledge. Zuk al il mazaka has been fed knowledge in the most, in the highest way possible. And this is very interesting because the Imams were ulul al. They were given knowledge by Allah. Abbas, of course, was, of course, was not an imam. But Amir al said that I have fed him knowledge. So he's very knowledgeable, a very knowledgeable person. And of course, he married when he was 18 years old with the daughter of Abdullah ibn Abbas, the great Hebrew ummah, the greatest scholar of the ummah. And uh, from that marriage, he had Ubaidullah and Fadl, who were scholars themselves and their descendants. So if we look into the into Ilm al-Hadith and Ilm al-Rajal, we see many descendants of Abbas, peace be on him, who were reporters of Hadith, who were jurists, who were people of uh, uh, literature, uh, ascetics, uh, scholars, and uh, like that. Uh, and Imam Sadiq salam says that Kana Ammun al Abbas Nafidu al Basira Sulbul Iman Jahadama Abi Abdullah alayhi salam wa ubliya bala an hasanan wa mada shahida. My uncle Abbas he had penetrating insight. Nafidu al Basira. Sulbul Iman, solid faith he had. He fought with Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdullah alayhi salam, wa upliya bala an hasana, and he was tried in a nice way. So now this shows that the whole incident of Karbala was bala un hasan, not bala un sayyah. It's very different. In the Quran we have about Banu Israel, wa bala hum bil hasanat wa sayyat. We try them with good and evil, with good things, with bad things. Things that they liked, things that they disliked. We tried them, and all the tribulations in their life, and all the good things and pleasures in their life are, are the benefits of life, are of life are trial for us. However, 
was this sort of death and martyrdom bala on Hassan? Was it khair or was it shar? Kullu nafsin da'iqatul maut wa nablukum bishar wal khair fitna. We always try you with shar or with khair. But was the incident of Karbala shar or khair? Certainly it was khair. It was khair for Hussein and his companions and shar for the Muslim Ummah, of course. It was shar for the Muslim Ummah. The way they, of course, treated a companion of the Prophet, the grandson of the Prophet, the family of the Prophet. Now, I, I finish by this hadith from as saduq rahmatullah alai, who says that Nadara Ali ibn al Hussein, Sayyid al Abidin, Ila Ubaidullah ibn Abbas, ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. I said that Ubaid, uh, Abbas alayhi salam had two sons, Ubaidullah and Fadl. Imam Zain al Abidin one day looked at Ubaidullah, son of Abbas alayhi salam. And just looking at him, he started to cry. Fasta'abar. Tears fell down from his eyes. Thumma qala ma min yawmin ashaddu ala rasulullah min yawm uhud. Qutila fih ammuhu Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. Asadullah wa asadu rasulullah. There was no day more bitter than uhud for the Prophet in which Hamza Asadullah, this was his title, the Lion of God and the Lion of the Prophet, he was killed in this battle. After that, the most bitter day, Ba'duhu Yawma Muta, the day in which the Battle of Muta took place in Syria, in which Qutala Fihi ibn Ammihi Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Ja'far al-Tayyar was martyred on that day. Then he said, ثُمَّ قَالْ وَلَا يَوْمْ كَيَوْمِ الْحُسَيْنِ But none of these days is similar to the day of Hussein, whether for Hussein himself or for the Prophet, or for all the Ahlul Bayt. قَتَلُوهُ بَغْيًا وَظُلْمًا They killed him while he was mazloom. They killed him while they oppressed him, they wronged him. وَأُدْوَانًا Out of animosity. Rahimallah al Abbas, and may God have mercy on Abbas, Falaqad Athara, Wa Ubliya, Wa Fada Akahu Benafse. He sacrificed himself for his brother until his hands were cut off, and Allah for that will give him two wings, just like my uncle Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, that he was given two wings and he was Ja'far al Tayyar. Abbas is also Tayyar. Wa inna lil Abbas, inda Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, manzilatan yaghbituhu biha jami'u shuhada yawm al qiyamah. And Abbas has a position with Allah that all shuhada would envy him on the day of judgment. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi tahirin. Are there any questions? Assalamu alaikum. alaikum Thank you very much for your lecture. Just, um, just one quick question, if I may, about Al Abbas. His arms were cut off, or was it his hands? Is there any indication in the hadith about that? I don't know. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Alaikum. You said that Usman, he did the Tawil, yes, after the Prophet's death. The interpretation. He had his own interpretation, yeah, yes. Interpret yeah. So, what was the time scale when the Prophet died and Usman doing it? Was it 10 years, 30 years, 40 years? Because, you know, I was, because I've heard this from English people, outside people. But why did not the Prophet, you know, when he had so many companions, put the book together then? What was preventing him? No, the book was there. The book was put together. Uh, 
But even now, we have the book now compiled, established, printed, however we disagree about the way we understand it. We disagree about the interpretation. If you are talking about the compilation at the time of Uthman, that was to unify all the copies. And that has a very, very long story. It was something which was urgently needed and was done properly, appropriately, and that is why now we have this Qur'an intact coming to us from the Prophet, peace be on him. Well, what I want to ask is, so, um, when was it um, put together? After the Prophet died? 10 years after? 20 years? You 20 see, years the companions before? wrote it according to what we understand. The companions wrote it at the time of the Prophet. And they had the compiled copies. Like Abdullah ibn Masood had his own copy, Umay ibn Kaab had his own copy, Ali ibn Abi Talib had his own copy. They had their own copies, okay? However, these copies, when they were copied again here and there, and went too far away to Egypt, to Syria, to, to Iraq, to Persia, then people started to somehow recite it differently, write it differently. That is why in the year well, Osman, of course, came to power 24 Hijra. That was about 13 years after the Prophet, 12 or 13 years after the demise of the Prophet. And just uh, a couple of years after that, about year 30, this was done. So 20 years after the Prophet. Yes. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Sheikh. Thank you very much. Is there another uh, way of pronouncing uh, this... Uh, verse or narration from Imam Zain al-Abidin. I'm asking, I'm not uh, claiming that I know. Abla, uh, Bala, and Hassan, because I hear that version of pronunciation in other instances. Does Maybe more correct. Could, yeah. Could, no, I'm not. Uh, I mean... Oblia is majhul, of course. And for me, I understand it this way. That's, I see. But Abla, Bala, and Hassan are You have not correct. come across it with the... Uh, no, no, I, I haven't. No. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, I know history is complicated, but is um, I have a question. It, did Imam Ali or the other Imams have anything complimentary to say about Uthman um, at all or to a limited extent? Did Imams had anything? Yes. Do to we say? have anything nice about him uh, in our? Uh, hadith or in our literature which uh, you quote from uh, various sources. Complimentary. Thank you. We may have, I, I cannot uh, remember now, but we may have something. Uh, what is usually mentioned is that uh, uh, the whole course of Muslim history changed after the four caliphs. So these things which happened at the time of Uthman were not so dramatic until it actually gave rise to the, uh, to the rulership of Banu Umayyah, Muawiyah, and then Ali Marwan. And then things changed from Khilafah to Mulukiyah. And therefore, yes, we could have a praise for that period of the four caliphs. Despite, of course, lots of misgivings that we have, we might have a praise for that. However, things started to deviate from here, from the time of Uthman. He, this is well-known fact, he actually uh, interpreted his uh, uh, generosity towards his family as Salatul Rahim and said, this is my way. The caliphs before me had their own ways, and this is my way. They did it for the sake of God. I do it for the sake of God. So this was the the beginning of this great rift between the seerah of the Prophet and, of course, the seerah of the Mulukiya that we had. Thank you very much, Sheikh. I think I'll end there. Thank Salawat. You.